A depressed office drone finds the monotony of his life suddenly disrupted when he's given a super secret assignment that neither he nor anyone else seems to understand in Paul Osborne's dark comedy, Fluorescent Beast, this week on the VFX for Indies podcast. Hello and welcome to this episode of VFX for Indies, the podcast about the intersection of visual effects and independent filmmaking. I'm your host, Paul Denigris, VFX artist, filmmaker, and CEO of Foxtrot X-Ray, a boutique visual effects company. With me today is Paul Osborne. He is the award-winning writer, director of a number of indie crime thrillers, including Ten Till Noon, which you see on the poster behind him, Cruel Hearts, and the upcoming Fluorescent Beast. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. Oh, well, thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Right on. I appreciate you taking uh, time out of your uh, busy schedule. Paul lives on the other side of the world uh, in England. Uh, he he used to be an Angelino, but he moved to uh, England a, a couple of years ago. And uh, um, we uh, we connect when we can when when the when we can time the uh, time zones correctly but um uh we we recently wrapped up um a last little bit of work on fluorescent beast a uh, film that uh that you shot what three years ago now Paul? uh Pre pre-pandemic we yeah we wrapped it up in may of 2019 oh okay so almost so four years ago now um uh, give us it. a <laughs> <laughs> The joys of independent filmmaking, right? Mm. Everything takes longer than it's supposed to. <laughs> well, before we dive into uh, the projects that we've collaborated on, Cruel Hearts and, uh, and Fluorescent Beast, it, just give us, our viewers a uh, quick overview of kind of who you are, what you do, um, you know, your position in the industry, uh, kind of where your career is at. My position on the bottom. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm an independent filmmaker, as you said. I, uh, I'm a writer, uh, a director, an editor. Um, and, uh, I, yeah, I've directed, uh, uh, four independent features. One was a documentary, three narrative features. And I wrote and produced, uh, another one, 10 till noon that you mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, I don't know. I moved two years ago from Los Angeles to London with my, uh, my wife and son. And, uh, I just, I'd been around the block, you know, I've done, I started in production, uh, worked in the production department, did, uh, props, did camera, did sounds. Uh, went to post-production, did, you know, ton of editings and feature editing, and then sort of flopped over where I wanted to go, which is the writing side. And uh, after a, a lot of time, uh, you know, dodging around agencies and development companies, not getting anything made, I decided to go the independent route. And uh, that brings us to where we are today. So neither of the films that that you've brought to me to work on with you are what we would really call visual effects films right they're 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 much more of the uh uh kind of the typical project that i work on with my team and also the 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 kind of project that we love where it's uh we can our work can be invisible right we're we're really there just to serve the story uh and not be flashy and not be in your face so uh, yeah. um yeah, I mean, give us a like, just give us a quick overview of Cruel Hearts and uh, and, and what it was about, and kind of, um, uh, you know, how we used visual effects in that in that film. Well, with you know, with, yeah, as you say, like these are not the typical visual effects movies. Cruel Hearts is a character driven, dramatic thriller. It's 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 you know, when you're making an independent film, it's always good to remember that uh, actors, good actors, are not expensive to find. There's a lot of them, and uh, dialogue is cheap to shoot. movies in the spaceship or the villain's lair there's always this auto self-destruct switch right uh -huh. yeah i mean i guess yeah okay people have those every single person has a self-destruct switch where were you last night excuse me don't want to answer the question you do what you gotta do and so will i i'm uh I've been sleeping with your wife. So <laughs> write good dialogue, get good actors, and then 
you have something. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a character based piece. It's a, it's more of a chamber piece and you don't often think of visual effects in those regards, but you, you are, I don't know, there's, there's two different kinds of visual effects that happen in those situations. And one of them is, you know, there's, there are, there are bursts of violence, you know, there's the, the occasional gunshot, the, you know, the case of sort of blood, those sorts of things. Um, and on a limited budget, it's, it's a lot of that's easier to do in post-production and less expensive to do in post-production. Some things, a lot of things when you don't get them right on set, but <laughs> even when you're intending to, when you the plans, things are going according to plan. Uh, yeah, a lot of it's still there. And also there's the second aspect of it is a sort of, um, things you can clean up in production, things that, that go wrong in production, the, the occasional boom shadow and, and, and clean up things that normally would have been a, a gaping, uh, error, in the pre-digital age can now be corrected and fixed. And, and, you know, things that would pull the audience out of it if you weren't able to fix it. So sort of the, uh, yeah, the intentional effects and the uh, unintentional fixes <laughs> that come to post-production. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, the, the the two big categories that we work in. Yeah, know, pretty what, much. What we call cleanup and then, and then yeah, more hero effects. Um, so what, what uh, problems, do you, and I know this is a while back, we're, we're, we're going back into deep into history, um, but not that you know, far, not that long not, ago, not that far, but, nah. um, it's, I mean, everything before the pandemic feels like it was a million years ago. That's true. <laughs> Back in the BC era. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. In the before times. So you um, want to know what, like what, like what sort of went wrong? <laughs> yeah. So there were, I know there were, obviously uh, there were some things that, um, that are, are in your face, right? The, the gunshots and things like that and right, some of the yes. blood enhancement. But then there are other things where they're, it's very subtle. And sometimes it was a matter of, like you said, it was the cleanup and the fixes. And sometimes it was, hey, we can't, we can't soak this carpet with blood <laughs> right. practically because it, it will cost too much to deal with the cleanup and, and the turnaround and, you know, all sure. of that sort of stuff, right? So, you know, what are some of the things that we helped, helped you, that VFX helped you solve? Well, and on that film, you know, we we had as a, a noir thriller. We've got the gunshots, we got the double crosses, and the bang, bang, bangs that happen. And um, as far as the you know the muzzle flashes, that stuff, we'd plan to do as a post production effect. It's it's less expensive and certainly safer to just bring in some airsoft BB guns without BBs in them, fire those off, and add in the muzzle flashes later. Um, that was always our plan, rather than bringing in an armor and bringing in a cop and you know dealing with blanks and, and certainly all the dangers that are, that are in those, especially when the guns are close to other actors, uh, blanks or no, you fire a, any kind of round, it's, you know, it's dangerous. Um, so that was always planned, but what we did plan to do on set was all the blood effects practically. And, you know, as what happens as this happened, also happened on the movie favor, which I know you didn't work on our feature of favor from a few years before that, but we, in both cases, our on-set visual effects people um, handling the blood effects, handling the squibs, handling the spurts were not really up to snuff. Part of that's budgetary in terms of uh, finding people who are experienced, who will <laughs> work on your budget. And part of it's also a budget, budget of time. You don't have, you need to budget in, you know, two to three times as long to shoot a scene if you're going to have blood effects. Um, often they, they take time to get right. They don't work. You have to reset. You have to change the clothes. And soon you, sometimes you just run out of time. So it's a combination of those two things. On Cruel Hearts, we just, you know, there were certain, there were certain blood hits that weren't working, squibs that weren't working. And, you know, in the end, we got what we got on set, but it meant coming to, to our post visual effects people, you, to, uh, to hopefully to, to fix them. <laughs> Hat in hand going, please, please <laughs> fix them. Um, so, you know, it was certain things in those hero effects were planned, certain things were not. But the big one in that film was the blood effects. There was a blood splat against the wall that had to be added. There was uh, a chest that had to be added. There's one character who is lying on the ground and riddled with bullets. And we needed to make him soaked in blood. And they only had, he only had a couple of trickles going on. And that was something. But there's something else that happens that, that, that happens in these films. And this is with anything because visual effects aren't just patchwork at the end, fixing a problem or, or, or completing an effect that you couldn't complete on set, whether you plan to do it that way or not. You know, it, it is a, a creative process. And 
you know, the, the word is always the last rewrite of a film is always the edit. The last rewrite of the film is always your post-production. It's not just the edit, it's the color corrections, the mix, and it certainly it's the visual effects. And so they were, I know there were things that uh, were added in visual effects in that film. I think you suggested that we ended up doing that, that ended up, uh, oh yeah, let's, let's try that. You know, we have the, if you wouldn't mind, let's, we have the opportunity now to add this new element that was never planned and improve the shot. And one of those you mentioned is actually the blood soaking the carpet. Cause I think we wanted to add a little bit of blood in the carpet and you're like, well, he's been riddled. Wouldn't he just, we could do a whole, and you made this beautiful balletic, just like blood spread out from him that we never thought about, but it completely makes the scene. And, um, so that's a situation where, you know, it's not just about fixing or adding something that was planned, but coming up with something new and, and using that opportunity while you're in there to create, a, you know, a whole new element of it. In Favor, this also happened in the movie Favor with a guy being stabbed and the visual effects artist decided to have the blood splat at the screen, splat towards camera. And I thought, great. That wasn't something we thought about. All you were doing was adding a little bit of blood on his shirt. He did this whole splat and he decided to add a splat on the lens. He created a splat on the lens. And I think he said it to me as a joke, but it was kind of amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, that's a terrific, like almost wink at the audience. And so we kept it in. Sometimes us VFX guys, we have to do stuff just to amuse ourselves and post. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's one, there's one vision, there's one moment in that also in, in Crow, I don't know if you remember this, but the blood spread, the character is addressing the camera, addressing the characters standing over him, which is the camera subjective and he's dying and the blood is spreading. And as he's, as the life's leaving him, the blood spread slows. And as he dies, stops and he's dying very, he's just getting, he's not like doing a big dramatic, but he's just slowly, the life is leaving his eyes. It's a very quiet moment, but the blood just slows and stops. And you said that to me and I was like, Paul, that's amazing. You've got the blood like matching the mood of his death. And you were like, uh, wait, what? It stops? Shit. That, no, that's, <laughs> you like it? You're, you're buying it? Good. Okay. That was not intentional. That's right. I do remember that. It was, it was a happy accident. And then you further art directed it and you said, let's have it stop before it passes his eyes. <laughs> right? I think I that give, if I remember I correctly, you, you were like, let's, let's start it oh. just as it reaches the that's, level of his eyes. Right. That's, so that, that's, yeah, that's, that sounds like me, Paul. That sounds yeah. like me. So it was, it was a happy accident. And then, and then a, it was a, 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 a bit of art direction and yeah, try doing that with a it practical was a, blood spread. You know, it was a, it was a creative urge from you, <laughs> an accident from wherever. And then a note from me. Great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's, that that's the uh, that's the joy of independent filmmaking at at, at every stage, right? At it's, every stage. Well, I mean, in filmmaking, I think you know, in general, like there were things in, uh, and we'll get to Florescent Beast in a moment, but there were things in Florescent Beast where you were suggesting we should do this, we should do this, we should try this, um, and that's honestly like from my point of view as a filmmaker, that's what I want. I want to work with other filmmakers. I want to work with other people who want to make the film better, and come up with come with ideas. And and again, visual effects are often thought about as a last stage, and they really ought not to be. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it sounds like your experience on favor probably informed some of your some of your choices in terms of knowing what you could and couldn't do in VFX and what you uh, how you could deploy VFX to fix some of these issues, the, you know, defective squibs and whatnot. Um, is that the case where, you know, favor favor really kind of influenced the the uh, process on cruel? Well, I think every film you make is influences the films that come after it. You're always learning, but I mean, I think I learned more on Cruel Hearts from you because the the problems on Cruel Hearts were more pronounced, you know, and solving those problems, making those those you know those those um, blo those bloody moments in that film look real, read as real, uh, you know, the way it was done, which was really taking practical elements and repurposing them in creative ways, you know, not adding new elements and, and a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it. And that really taught me a lot more about on my end, how to, how to bring things into, into visual effects.
So, but yeah, you learn in every film. Favor certainly taught me some things, but Cruel Hearts was a much more extensive job. I remember a shot, a couple of shots in Cruel Hearts where uh, Patrick has to punch, he has to punch a tile wall in a bathroom. Yep. And then, and so you, you had us add the cracks in the tile, but then also split his knuckles. Yeah. So where, where did that, was that something that you thought of in, in production or was it only after you saw it in the cut? that you? Uh, it was after something? we saw it, you know, it just, it didn't read what we had done on set at all. It didn't read. It was too subtle. And so I'm like, you got to help me, <laughs> help me sell this, <laughs> help this thing. So, I mean, that, that looks, those knuckles look terrific. I mean, we had like blood on them, but it was uh, nothing. So again, l learning curve, yeah. you know, you go, well, this will, this will be fine. And then you put it up on a 60 foot screen and you go, no, it's not at all. You need a lot more there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was a total cheat. Just having a little bit of uh, a little bit of white show through as if he had split it down to the bone and it, and, and it, it's like, you look at it and you go, Oh, you cringe. Yeah, no, it's, like it looks painful. It's great. <laughs> well, as opposed to was, just blood smeared on his. Right. Neck. Yeah. I mean, this, that was just, you know, a low budget situation where we had a location and we couldn't, afford to have him act, actually build a fake wall and have him punch it and have him crack it. Right. You know, that's what it was. So we had to punch, we had to punch it kind of, so he's punching, he's punching a pillow. <laughs> that's what he's doing. Yeah. And the whole idea is when you cut back to, he looks, he realizes what he's done. You're looking at his face while he's doing the punching and he cut back and you see what he's done to himself. And that had to, to read. And thankfully, thanks to you, it, it does. Right. Um, but yeah, but it wasn't reading enough. You have to really, punch it a lot more. And so what's, what's something else we learned going forward is any day you have anything like that, you have a very salty and experienced visual effects artist uh, a, a, or a makeup person does makeup effects. You have them on set. Yeah. And a lot of the work that we do um, when it comes to blood or, or anything like that is it's a, it's a combination of the efforts of us in post and the efforts of, of folks on set. You know, it's um, I, I always, Whenever I'm talking about this stuff where it's we're fixing blood or we're fixing makeup, it's never it's never meant as a we're, we're not trying to downplay the expertise of special effects people because what they do is amazing. And the and the the um, the, the the limits of their ability based on time and money. Right. Right. Well, and, that's and, that's and, ultimately and, it. Yeah, I can push and, and pixels around all day. Right. I can push. <laughs> I can push blood pixels all around all day and you can go, I want it to spray different. So I can swap it out to a different element, change the parameters on a particle sim. You know, I can do that on set. You're burning, you're burning money. You're burning daylight. You're, you know, you're in locations that you don't own. You have limited changes of clothes, right? So the practical makeup people are always operating with, you know, one hand tied behind their back, no matter what. Right. right? So, so, so I, I, I want, people to understand if they, as they watch this, what I do, what visual effects artists do is never a replacement for good practical special effects makeup. We are an enhancement. Exactly. And that, well, that, and honestly, that's the way it should be. If you, if you, in the low budget world, it's always, you know, the first thing is to find someone who can work with your budget, who's either experienced, whether it's professionally or on their own, but can really deliver what you need. But even then, like, there, there are limitations. There are time limitations and money limitations. If you, and I say this, like if you, if you can schedule twice as much time to three times as much time shooting anything with any kind of makeup effects, if you've got, you know, someone's getting macheted or shot or karate chopped or whatever it is, add in the time, not just for the applications, but for things to go wrong to not get it right and have as many replacement clothes as you can, because you are going to go through them. Um, but also if you do think you're going to need, you're going to go, if you plan ahead and go, you know, we're going to need visual effects to help us with this post-production visual effects, to help us with this. It's always important to talk to your visual effects person, your post visual effects person, I should say, and say, what, what do you need me to give you to create this? You know, like we're doing it, we're going to do, I got to get shot in the head. This is something that we just did in the last film. I got to get shot in the head. And so we're going to have, we'll have, you know, makeup effects, put a bullet hole in his head, you know, and what we're going to have, we want it to appear when he gets shot in the shot, you know, it's a single shot on him and the bullet bang hits him in the face. So it's a question of getting a clean plate with a clean forehead. It's a question of getting, you know, and, and shooting the shot with the thing, with the wound there the entire time. And then you put the clean forehead 
image over the the hole until the appropriate moment and getting a, a clean shot of the flash on him so that when there's a you know a practical light flash on his face that re- that replicates the gun fla- muzzle flash of the gun and all these elements that are created on set which when they come to you you can go put it together rather than having right. to try to capture it and uh, honestly that's often it sounds like it's more work on set it's often easier to get to shoot individual elements to have them compo- real elements realistic looking elements practical elements to have them composited by a post visual effects person than it is to capture an on camera perfect visual effect absolutely from my experience absolutely. yeah no, I, I think that's uh, that's absolutely dead on. That's what we uh, in the industry call, uh, in the VFX side of the industry, we call a heal and reveal, right? The, <laughs> the, 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 act, the actor has the wound already. We heal it and then reveal it when the gunshot goes Love off. it. Yeah. Heal yeah. and reveal. Heal and reveal. Yeah, but uh, you know, there, there were other things. Like we had a fire effect on the last film, and you know, it was a question of how, what elements do we give you for that, and you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. So again, it's, well, it's, we're we're gonna get to fluorescent beast in a second. Mm-hmm. I want to kind of wrap up our conversation. About sure. Sorry, I'm I'm bopping no, all over. That's that's totally fine. Um, so it sounds to me, and I think we've kind of covered this. It sounds to me like um, the process on it, in the same way that favor taught you a bunch of stuff that you applied to cruel hearts. It sounds like you had some some takeaways from the process of cruel hearts that that cascaded into the next movie. Um, you know, what's something. What's one example that maybe we haven't covered yet of something that you, we did a certain way on Cruel Hearts that you decided, okay, we need to we, we need to be better prepared going into Fluorescent Beast. Uh, well, I uh, <laughs> honestly, it was the it was all the blood stuff. It was really it was really making sure we and we kind of cover this. I know, but sorry, but it, it is it's absolutely my my biggest takeaway. My the one I always think about is capturing practical elements on camera that you can then repurpose later in visual and post visual effects. And that really is everything. I, I think it was one effect. I forget what it was. We were, I think we were trying to get, I think it was a, 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 head, a headshot in curl. We were trying to get right. And I said to you, um, I, you said, what do you think? I said, well, this looks like a, like a digital visual effect. And you said, this is a digital visual effect. <laughs> and I said, I know it's a digital visual effect and you know, it's a digital visual effect, but we don't want anybody else to know it's a digital visual effect. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it was at that point, I think we didn't have anything made. I think you ended up um, stealing something from the other, another scene right. that was bloody and clothy and whatever and applying it. If I'm, I could be misremembering that, but you can correct me. But that's really my biggest takeaway. And I, we had a lot of conversations about the things on the next one, Florence and Peace, like, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to shoot it. What do I got to shoot for you? You know? Yeah. That's what it is. And uh, it's a really different way of thinking about how you do things. You know, you don't want to just shoot a thing and expect a magic wand to create whatever. There will be plenty of those. When we get to Florissa Boots, we can talk about a couple of magic wand moments that you had to pull out of your butt. But uh, (laughs) things we didn't plan, some big ones. Um, uh, There's always something. But whenever possible... You know, and, and it could be as simple as, you know, we need to, for lighting, we have to have this window next to this actor, you know, the, the blind straw, we have to have the window closed and, and blocked off because it's casting a glare right in the lens. But we want what we're, what we see out that window, downtown LA, we want that visible behind him. Okay. So then you got to shoot plates. You know, that's, that's something you do. You shoot the actor, you draw the blinds, you shoot the actor. The actor steps out, you open the blinds, you shoot the exact same angle with the blind open with nothing in it, you know, for 30 seconds or, whatever, or however long. And, you know, you get those, you have to get those kinds of clean plates. And sometimes there's multiple elements so that they can be composited later. But it really is understanding and breaking down how you want to do things. A lot of this goes back just to as much preparation as possible. Unfortunately, as of yet, you will attest, I have never done enough prep when it comes to things that need to be visually realized in post in terms of visual effects. Um, but I'm learning and I'm hoping to get better. So, No one ever does enough prep, right? It doesn't matter how much prep you do. It's never enough. Uh, there's, there's so many, there's so many um, on-the-day factors, you know, and a larger budget film has time to reshoot or time to 
shoot longer and catch these. And then when you're shooting a feature in three weeks, you don't have that much time. You're, you're constantly moving. You lose location, that location's gone. Right. As they say in the military, no plan meets, no plan survives initial contact with the enemy. Right. And uh, when it comes to independent filmmaking, time and money are always the enemy. And so plans are, planning is invaluable. Plans themselves generally are useless. (laughs) (laughs) uh all right so where can um well let's just let's just wrap up cruel hearts sure what was its uh festival life uh and going into distribution uh and then where can people watch it right now uh well it's uh it did about uh 10 festivals won a few awards uh Came out on uh, Valentine's Day, Cruel Arts, <laughs> which I thought was an odd choice. Uh, it was on the it was on the romance page of iTunes, which I thought was weird. Like, who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna go to the romance section and want to watch a film with guns in it? You go watch the trailer, you just look at the poster. I think it should have been in the thrill, in the thriller section on Valentine's Day. But um, <laughs> Gravitas Ventures uh, put it out it was our second film out with them, and uh, right now you can get it on. Well, I mean, you can buy it on all the. Uh, the pay VOD flavors, you know, iTunes and so forth. Uh, but I believe it's streaming on, um, on Amazon. If you're a member for free, uh, it's on Tubi for free for anyone, uh, with commercials. Uh, so if you want to watch it for free, check it out on Tubi. Uh, and it might be on freebie. I'm not sure. And there's also a, a Blu-ray edition running around somewhere. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a great movie. And, well, thank uh, you. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I wish, uh, I, I wish we had been able to do even more on it because uh, it was it was a blast working on it and uh, and the cast you put together was fantastic. Oh, well, thanks, man! Uh, including uh, including Melora Harden from The Office. Yeah, uh, who's an absolute sweetheart. I um, I don't know if I ever told you. I reached out to Melora when my nephew uh, my nephew Joseph turned eighteen. No, he's the biggest biggest fan of The Office I could possibly find, and. Um, so I reached out to Moore. I said, "Hey, Moore, remember me? I did VFX on Cruel on Paul Osborne's movie Cruel Hearts, and uh, my my nephew is a, a massive fan of The Office. Um, could you uh, could you record him a little video for uh, for his birthday?" And she sent just the sweetest video. Oh, that's for, awesome! For, yeah, she was she was an, just an absolute angel. Sent, like sang a song and oh my god, and uh, and get, and get made up her own uh, her own custom. That's what she said. Joke just for him. <laughs> Yeah, the kid's face lit up when I played it. I was like, "Oh, that's great." She's—I yeah. mean, <laughs> I, I've known her do nothing but a sweetheart. Yeah, but you know, but I also paid her. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, no, she's great. Actually, she has a new film coming out called uh, Golden Vanity. Yeah, uh, and it's—I uh, think it's world premiering at the Burbank International Film Festival actually in a few months, and so she'll be touring around with that soon. So it's nice. it, it, it's an all Melora movie. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I mean, you know, the fact that you were able to attract her among other just wonderful actors just speaks to your, oh, well, uh, well your, thank you. Your writing. Uh, and then the fact that she didn't um, say, uh, you know, she didn't tell me to, to, <laughs> to beat it when I asked her for a favor. <laughs> that that means guy. You guys must have treated her well. On set. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. I've, she, she still, she still returns my calls That's and good. texts. So I hope That's so. Good. <laughs> All right, so cool. Let's move on to uh, Fluorescent Beast, which is uh, which is the film that uh, that you recently finished. The and, new one. Um, the new one. Give us a quick synopsis of this one. It's uh, it, to, to me, it feels very different than previous ones. It is. Well, it's not a crime thriller for starters. It's black comedy. It's a surreal black comedy. And I, so I'll tell you the the plot, and I'll tell you what it's about. Like a different thing. So the plot is basically about this kind of middle management worker guy uh, is working for a big corporation, kind of this generic job, it's sort of ill-defined, pushing numbers around. And he gets um, summoned by a bizarre and shadowy executive who sends him on a secret business trip. And the business trip is so secret, he's not even told what it's about. He's sort of sent there and he's given cryptic memos periodically that tell him the next step of the thing he needs to do. And these things don't really add up, make a lot of sense. And he's sort of got to kind of put together what these are, what these memos are leading him to do and solve the mystery of what is the actual nature of his assignment. And as the picture begins to emerge, he begins to realize that it may not be turn out so well for him.
You wanted to see me? Someone high up has requested a meeting with you. You've been summoned. Nelson Shell? You are Nelson Shell. Yes? I have a task for you to perform, Shell. It may or may not be easy, it may or may not be pleasant, but it must be done. Don't forget to let out the dog. Do you know what you are? Yeah. Do you think you're a man? Yeah. You are not a man. You. Yeah. Are a cog. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a what? A cog. That's the plot. Uh, what it's about is I like to say that it's, um, you know, all the, it's as if all the pressures of being an adult, all the responsibilities that weigh you down, if all of those were not a happenstance, but an actual active conscious conspiracy aimed at you personally to crush your soul and ruin your dreams, that's what, that's <laughs> That's the, the premise of the film. <laughs> I described it to somebody on set, and they went, "Oh, but that's not that's not that's not fiction. That's that's true." Right. right. The fluorescent beast feels a bit to me like, what if the Coen Brothers directed Office Space? Oh, oh wow. Okay, please, <laughs> please. I'm gonna, that's going to go on the on the box art and the poster. <laughs> what if the Coen Brothers directed Office Space? That's a huge compliment <laughs> and a huge it's, insult to the Coen Brothers in Office Space. <laughs> for no, no, no. I and I, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm a I'm a big fan of Paul Osborne, and I, I wow, think it's uh, I, I think it's a just a great piece of filmmaking. My involvement, you know, completely uh, regardless, right? I it's it is a great watch, and it is. Well, thank you. I've watched it a couple of times, and it it asks some really interesting questions, and uh, and and the, again, the acting is is stellar. Oh, well, I well, I hope my actors are listening to this right now because uh, they did a great job. Uh, you know, they, I didn't I didn't mess them up too much. So um, I'm glad you like. It. I hope I hope uh, I hope some film festivals agree with you. We're uh, we're out to several right now, so we'll see what happens. Great, great. So how did um, how did the process of getting visual effects uh, incorporated into your workflow? How is the process on on fluorescent beasts different than Cruel Hearts? You know, again, ta taking the lessons from Cruel, Cruel Hearts forward, right. what what did we do differently? Uh, in well, there were Beast? a couple of key scenes that we knew we were going to need, uh, you know, post visual effects for, and there was a, some gunshots, some some uh, some blood, but the uh, one big thing was a fire sequence. We have a scene where someone's burning something like something large and they're sitting right next to it while it's burning. And I didn't want to light an actual fire one, because I wanted to be able to shoot multiple takes and, uh, and multiple angles with one camera. <laughs> I want to keep burning stuff. Uh, and two, I have an actor standing, you know, three feet from the fire who I don't want her to, you know, die of smoke inhalation and she's a, a, a new mom and was breastfeeding and I wanted to poison her child with carbon dioxide. So that, I mean, that was a, a big conversation we had is how to make that look. Cause it's, we weren't going to, I think originally we were talking about burning, actually burning something like burning something somewhere else of a similar dimension and shooting that as a plate. And you were, you, we ended up going a different way with it. I think you had, you had plates that already existed, which was great. Not having to burn stuff. Um, but, uh, um, that was one big conversation we had. There was another, another, uh, conversation we had about a, a prop in the film. There's a puzzle box. That's like a, it's like a rectangular black box and there's no, there's no crack on it, no seam, no way to open it. And eventually it gets opened in, in the, in the film, the guy finds a couple of pressure, invisible pressure plates and it pops open. And the prop guy was making the thing and he, he's like, there's no way to make this the way you want it to open and hide the seam. Like you will see a seam no matter where. It can't be a seamless thing. So we ended up making two, one with and one without a seam. And the decision was we're going to have in post, we're going to have the seam appear like a, like a, like a crack in a piece of wood that's being stressed. Um, so there were things like that, that we had discussed in advance. You know, I had long conversations about how to shoot them and what was needed. And, and so that was the, the, the big thing was putting a lot more planning and a lot more of our conversations dictating the angles we chose, how we covered things, and then certainly what we shot to cover those effects. Um, yeah, I would say I would say, Cruel Hearts, the balance between creative shots and 
fix it shots, cleanup shots was probably about 50, 50. Yeah. And I think on fluorescent beast, it was more like 25% cleanup, 75% creative. If uh, I, and that's just my well, gut. Let's, are we, are we going to talk about the painting stuff? Cause those are, that was, we can, that, I mean, we certainly that's, can. That's, that's cleanup. <laughs> <laughs> I think that throws your balance back to more to 50, 50. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. But it just was, it it felt like we put more energy, certainly lots more did. energy up front. Um, into we did creative shots. Yeah, uh, because you were already thinking along those lines. You already kind of knew. Okay, right. Here's what we here's what we're capable of. Uh, or yeah. you asked the question, "How Paul? How the hell do we do this?" Correct. Yeah, and the, the, there were uh, there were several small visual effect moments. I mean, the film again. It's a surreal black comedy. There are odd things that that happen and there's a, a garbage can that you know, there's, there's a, there's this uh, memo in the film that keeps being passed around as this important piece of this, is, uh, this important memo, you know, it's a red letter. It's a, you know, it's so important and they keep passing it around and then eventually it reaches its destination and the person goes, great, thank you. And just throws it in the trash, discards it as if it's nothing. And it's never even opened. It's a whole joke about, is useless paperwork and whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's a, it's a running gag that ends in just someone throwing away this supposedly very important piece of paper. When the character looks in the garbage can at the discarded letter, we want it like it's a sort of sizzle and then almost ex, you know, explode in there. And that was something that, again, that was a, a, you know, a, a, a conversation that you and I had, how we were going to do it. And uh, it ended up being an odd, an odd mixture of things. Uh, Basically, we had the garbage can sitting there as a shot of the garbage can, just sitting, you know, on the floor, dark, nothing, you can, nothing visible in it. The letters allegedly at the bottom, you don't really see it. It's out of the shot. And then we took another, did another it's the same angle. And I put a, uh, we put a small handheld light in there. So the trash can was full of light. I did a, I did a simple dissolve, I had it go, whoosh, had it suddenly flare up. And then you took that. And added a whole like Vietnam napalm thing, which is <laughs> hilarious. A little um, curl of smoke. <laughs> right. But again, we, we knew and a little curl of smoke. But again, we knew exactly <laughs> where those things were going to happen. And every single one we had planned um, pragmatic effects, pragmatic um, uh, practical stuff shot on set to supply you with hopefully enough of what you needed. I, I, hopefully you weren't left wanting. There were a few other situations where you follow this is, this falls into accidental or this falls into creative, but things that we changed when you saw the movie, uh, for example, the scene where he goes to a mall and yeah. you had, you, you suggested, you know, why don't we remove all the names of all the stores? Not because they weren't clear. We have multiple names and this multiple things. It was no big deal. But it was, why don't we just remove them to make it weird, to make it just really faceless, you know? And that was a creative choice that you, I'm like, that's a great idea. So you <laughs> kindly did that. And then there was one store where the, the store, the name was too, it was too obvious that it was missing. So we had to replace it with something. We made up a whole new store name that doesn't exist and replaced it with that. So it was all right. seemed otherworldly, you know, that, whether, does that fall into accidental? Does that fall into creative i think it falls into creative but again it's something not thing we planned mm. um but yeah that was when we, we really tried to anticipate what we needed on set and give you everything and again this is the occasional boom shadow or the occasional wire that you remove but i think most of it was that stuff until the painting yeah yeah another another thing before we get to the painting another thing that you you do and we did it a tiny bit on cruel hearts and i think we did it a few times on fluorescent beast was using vfx as an editorial tool Right. So there's a there's a scene in Cruel Hearts where the two characters are at the bar and you wanted to cut some dialogue out. Yes. Am I remembering correctly? And we you composited are. somebody crossing. Yes. So that you, we could hide a cut. Right. Yeah. So that that was an early example. And then I think in Fluorescent Beast, if I'm not mistaken, didn't we adjust the timing between actors at one point or adjust that we had actors yes. in different takes? Yes. No, we, 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 we pulled something up. Yeah, no, it was two, it was two actors sitting in the same shot. We, we, there were, there were a number of, of, uh, of simple, like, uh, picture and picture effects that were done on the film that you weren't even involved with <laughs> because we can, we can like, like we, we had two characters, we had two characters played by the same actor, for example, in a couple of scenes. Right. And we just, you know, would put the camera down, you know, and shoot one on one side 
and then one on the other side. And just, you know, as long as the camera doesn't move, it's easy to do a composite. You just you split it. You can do that in the editing tool. There was one situation and there were a few like things like that. We would, we would change the timing in a two shot, but this is one you're talking about one on the couch, right? Mm. It's, a, it's the same where a, a lead character and his wife are on the couch. And the, yeah, I ended up the, I think we were, I don't know if we were compositing takes. I think it was a, an awkward pause. I think it's what it was, but we tried doing it simply, but there was a whole, a pillow shift or something. There was some shift in it and you had to kind of go in and like carve around. It wasn't a clean cut. It wasn't a clean sp splice. Right. So it had to be done that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we also had, <laughs> you decided you wanted one of the characters to never blink. Oh, I forgot that about a, that. That was a fun challenge. That was a fun challenge. That was one we knew we were going to do. That was, a, that was in the script stage. That she never blinks. And uh, you never see your eyes closed. That was the idea. And so it's funny. I made the mistake of telling her that, which made her try to not blink. And I'm like, don't just, just we'll, we'll fix it. We'll fix it in post. I mentioned it to you and you're like, uh, okay. Um, and I don't, th I don't, how much, it didn't seem like it was that much. It was no trouble on my end. I gave it the shot. She gave him back totally blinkless. Um, I, don't know, I know that there was the one shot where she turns her head on a blink. That one caused you problems because there was no clean frame of her eye open to duplicate the eyes on. There was no moment where the eyes were open at that exact angle because her head was turning. Right. Yeah. She, when, um, yeah. But because we naturally, when we blink or when we turn, we naturally blink to yeah. sort of skip the in-between to we, skip the camera we, move. We add a cut. We add a cut, right? yeah. And um, and and every take where she did it, she went from looking at looking at her husband to looking at her plate, and she would blink on the move. Yeah, and it was a wide shot. There was no way to get around it. Yeah. So on that particular one, we ended up using a face tracking tool and rebuilt her face as a CGI right. mesh, a CG mesh. Yeah. And projected her 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 face basically took took the footage that your camera saw projected it onto that mesh unwrapped it as a texture then erased the blinks by painting over and then projected that back on top of the yeah so it was that was a multi-stage uh, uh effect there were a couple of them like that that in particular one was was the the hardest yeah, the rest really of them were yeah the rest of them were pretty straightforward because she yeah. was you know, you can pick up the eyes from either side of the blink and do a do like a morph, a slight between yes. them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I morph a slight shift. Yeah, uh, and there were times that I would do. I use a. a I'm cutting in the avenue. I would use fluid morph, and I would right. just cut out the blink and do it that way. She was fairly still. Her fair, her character was, as written, fairly robotic. Hence the no mm -hmm. blinking and such. So there was a lot of like, not she would she was eye contact was very direct and she wouldn't move a lot and so it was really fairly. It did to please a few myself, but that one, it's funny when she turned her head, that weird model of her face you made, the first thing you sent me, it was like, it was like you'd done like 18 versions and it still wasn't working. I was like, and you're like, damn it. And so you sent me the model of the face turning, but with nothing else, no shot. It was just in a sea of blackness, this bizarre face just blah, floating through the darkness. I sent that to her, by the way, without any explanation. I just wrote you yeah. and I said it to the actress and she just, I may have, may have given her some nightmares. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it is sort of nightmare fuel. It's sort it's of like sort of somebody has, somebody has peeled the face off and just has yeah. it floating in 3d space. It's, yeah. it's, it's pretty uncanny. Um, yeah, that was uh that was a fun one to, to unpack how to do that. And also how to just make it look right because yeah, the, our eyes are human eyes are so animated and, audiences are conditioned we are conditioned to look at each other's eyes when we're when we're seeing pe people's faces right yeah, yeah. so it's Im almost impossible you you can't when you're doing something to an actor's eyes there's nothing to distract the audience you, there's no you can't go oh look over here while i while i pull right. some right, some right, sh right. You know, shenanigans right. over here and hide this thing from you right. look at this lens flare like it doesn't it doesn't work like, no and, and to the right and well and to the nature of the scene that this takes place in it's a wide shot and there's no way to, I mean, this is a, 
to go deep baseball into this movie without anybody having seen it, but it's really yet. But, but the way that the nature of that sequence, there's no way, there's no way to cut to something else. She has to be on camera for that moment, the entire time in this wide shot, you know, and yeah, fortunately you were able to find a solve. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd still be working on it. <laughs> Otherwise, the whole letter blank, just letter blank. No, it's great. She just, it's funny. People watch the movie and they don't they don't know why it unsettles them. Like, there's something really off. And it's like, hopefully, it's it's no one only, well, they'll hear this and now they'll put it together. But hopefully, those that don't will, will go, oh, you know, there's something really off. Because we are used to, we do look at each other's eyes and we are conditioned to, I mean, we're so innately familiar with what's human as human beings. And when we see something that's not quite human, we read it quickly. You know, right. um, someone doesn't blink when they turn their head. Someone doesn't blink ever. That's we recognize that is not not right, not human. And uh, that yeah. was the whole intent of that character. Yeah, so. and it was, and you know, there were times when her expression would change. Like the, so, she would be changing the her the expression on her face during, so during her the blink. Mouth, her mouth and her eyebrows are changing and the blink is happening during that transition. Right. So we're having to remove the, the, the blink, but keep the transition and, and have her eyes get slightly wider. Right. Or maybe slightly go, na- more narrow. Face. Right. 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 Yeah. So that, and to not trip us into the uncanny valley right. where you go, Oh, what is that? That's right. weird. Right. It should right. just be a cumulative effect of, you know, after you've watched the movie, I swear to God, that character never blinked. I have to watch it again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> watch so it let's talk about the- more times. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the painting. Right, the painting. This was the, this was where I think it, it went, we went from uh, twenty five to fifty percent. So, in the film, uh, there's a painting painted by one of the characters, and she's not a professional painter in the movie, but she is supposed to be talented. Like this is like something she can do well, um, and we wanted an, we needed an original painting for this. So um, it was not key to the story, exact. Well, not key central, um, but we we did have this need, needing to be done. And the way that it was done was I shared uh, production designer duties and just everything else I was doing with one of the producers, and uh, he's a painter and also a photographer. And he's like, you know, I'll take care of the painting, no problem. I'll take care of it. So. But I just schedule things running amok. He was falling behind on it. And so he was actually creating the painting downstairs while we were lighting the scene. That's, and it came onto set wet. Like it was that, like we need, that's it, right? We got to shoot this thing. So we shot with this painting and it's in several scenes uh, featured and also in the background. So it's, it's just there. It's a presence in the scene. When we shot it, you know, it was something that I think and I don't, I, you know, uh, I, my producer Jay, who is the one who painted it, uh, he'll be the. I'm not throwing him under the bus here. He'll be the first to admit didn't really quite measure up to what we needed. Wasn't quite good enough for this where this where this character is supposed to be. Um, doesn't sink the movie, but it was something that was problematic. And as I, I thought, well, this is something maybe we can live with. But as we went along with new cuts and revisions and working on the film, all of us felt that it was really kind of dragging it down. Like this is this is something it should be a better piece of art so that it became, all right, we need to find more money to have uh, the great Paul de Negris <laughs> replace this painting in about 40 shots. Um, uh, so that was, that was the painting. And uh, again, that's not something that's a, that's a fix it. That's exactly what it is. So we commissioned a piece of art that we were happy with and, uh, but it only existed as a digital piece of art. So you had to not only, um, place it, you had to add a uh, canvas texture to it. So it would look authentically in the space. You had to, you know, move it in 3d space to match it, fit, fit whatever angle it was. And then you had to burn it, which <laughs> <laughs> the burning was planned, but you had to burn your digital painting right. texture layer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And for the most part, it was, relatively simple right it's a it's a it's a square canvas yeah planar track you know 
where it became a problem was uh, you had your lead characters having a, a conversation a right in front of long the conversation, including lots of hand gestures directly in front of it. And uh, hands do this fun thing where they motion blur and they almost disappear. Oh, yeah in the texture of whatever's behind them Correct. as they're moving. And, right. so and we, it wasn't we were, lit to be replaced. So it wasn't like we right. lit it. We lit it with like a highlight or whatever to separate it. There's no, yeah. it's just, there's no separation. We weren't thinking we were going to need to replace this painting at any point. Yeah. So yeah, yeah there's a few tricky shots with that with, uh, or, or her, uh, it's over the shoulder shots. The one character has her hair up and there's wisps of hair dangling in front of that canvas. Yep. I'm sure that must've been a fun treat. Yeah, so we had we had a fair bit of uh, edge re- edge repair that we had to do on things, and and actually like rebuilding the fingers and um, and all of that to get it to work. Yeah, but but again, it's the kind of thing that yes, you say it didn't sink the movie, but the movie works so much better with that painting being uh, agreed. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. the The idea is it's supposed to be that she is. She's passionate enough t- and good enough at that that sh- that's yeah. what she should be doing, but she's not doing. And that's part of the it's part of the tragedy of the movie. Yeah, is that she's not pursuing being an artist. Yes, exactly. And if, it, and if it's a bunch of stick figures, you just go well, right. no, no great loss. <laughs> there, there are a lot. Of, there are a lot of would be artists in the film, and some of them we intentionally created bad art. Like they, well, they're just not very good. But then some we wanted to be like no, but this person actually is really good. We want to create kind of a spectrum, you know, which is all artists that there's a spectrum, especially among non-professional artists. So we had fun creating some bad art, and, but that was one where it really needed to be like, she's like a little bit of a, you know, like she could do this, you know, and yeah. it would mean, it would mean something if she could do this professionally. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff I, I love, you know, regardless of how hard it is to like fix edges and wispy hair and moving hands and all of that stuff. It's my team and I being part of your team made your film visibly viscerally better yeah right uh, yeah and, absolutely you know it's uh, when, when i say and 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 i would say yes it's a cleanup but but really it wasn't it wasn't a they, those weren't cleanup shots like hey there you know there's a c-stand visible in the in the in the window in the reflection or you know that right that stuff take it or leave it that you know that any technician, any good visual effects technician should be able to do that stuff. It's where we get to help you better art direct your movie or better sell a story point. Yeah, to better That's, tell to better yeah. tell the tale. Exactly. You know, we are all That's filmmakers. Where I thrive. On. That yeah. yeah. That's that's where I always want to be is is I, I wanna I wanna spend I wanna spend your VFX budget doing stuff that matters. <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to, I, I only want to spend money on VFX doing stuff that matters. So we're, yeah. <laughs> we're on the same team there. Yeah. Uh, but it's true. And this is true for, you know, with, with independent film, every, everybody working on your film is a collaborator and everybody on your film, hopefully is, is contributing, just telling the tale. Everybody on is working as a filmmaker and especially people who adding in who are in, especially your creative key positions. I think everybody, I think down to your PA, down to your craft service, honestly. Um, you know, I, the, I try to, you know, have everybody on set feeling for feeling that they can contribute. And thus far I've been lucky enough that they feel like they can, and you know, they come up with good stuff. I don't care who comes up with the best idea. Let's all make this thing together. Um, but certainly, you know, it's important to stress that once shooting wraps, your, your, uh, visual effects, people, your, uh, sound people, your sound designer, your mixer, uh, your color people, these are all, they're all, they're there to help you do the final rewrite of the film. You know, they're there to make the film not just, you know, prettier, better creatively, story-wise, you know, that painting, replacing that painting changes and improves the story. Period. Absolutely. Stripping out those weird ass, uh, (laughs) making them all look bizarre. And, and, and soulless and dead, <laughs> that's contributing to the story. That says something it didn't say before, you know, that I would, that it wouldn't have said, have you not brought that to the table? You know? Right. So exactly. And that's, you know, I, and thank you for coming on board to doing that because that makes the film better. 
Yeah, and it's it's always it's always a pleasure to 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 play on your movies because you, know, <laughs> you are you are that open you know that open collaborator. I can say, hey, what if we try this? And I get and to take cre- times when I I throw something out, and you're like, yeah, no, we're not. I'm not concerned <laughs> about that, or no, that's not going to work, right? And that's that's a director's job, right? Yeah, you basically, yeah, it's to, it's to take it's to field all the ideas and which ones work on this story. You have to kind of know what hangs on the spine, and like I said, I get to take credit for it afterwards. So <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm good. I'm good with that. As well. I get to stand there at the queue and say, "Yes, that was my idea." No, yeah. I don't at all. But, um, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. It's like you know, you what what does hang on the vine? There are things often that that I come up with that don't. People go, "Yeah, that's not going to work." You can't. You're telling this, like, oh, okay, yeah. you know, yeah. Right on. Uh, so we don't know. We don't know when when Fluorescent Beast will be hitting festivals. We we do not. Uh, it was uh, yeah. We're it, we're in the whole submission land right now. You want to make some phone calls? Want to call some uh, festival directors and uh, send some threatening emails and uh, or, or bribes? I hear bribes are good. Um, yeah. No, it's just a, just a wait and see at this point. See what yeah. happens. I mean, that's something that unfortunately is just you know part of the part of the process um even when you know the festival people you send it into them and they there's a, a, a festival uh programmers have this cone of silence that they kind of go into when they're programming because mm-hmm. they never know what can happen and so even if they love your movie and and they want to play it right away you still don't talk to you until it's time to announce so right at least they don't talk to me i don't know maybe maybe, maybe you found a different story hey um you made a movie, and you can do a quick plug on this. You made a movie about the festival circuit, didn't you? I did make a movie about the film festival circuit called Official Rejection, which is uh, was came out in two thousand nine because I am a uh, hundred thousand years old now. Uh, that's uh, that's also available on uh, Prime, I believe, uh, free for if you're if you're a member. And there's a nice DVD with all kinds of special features floating out around about that one. But yeah, that that one was talking about the festival circuit at the time. I still think it's a fairly good primer on the festival circuit. Um, but I, it's funny. I think the circuit's gotten a lot tougher uh, lately. And I think, you know, it's, it's part of that is streamers have realized this is a good place to launch films and an easy way for them for films to, that they're putting out to get theatrical play that they wouldn't normally get. They could say to these filmmakers, well, we're not going to do a theatrical release, but we'll play you at a festival. And so they of course, are going for top tier festivals for the most part, but there were already these sort of, you know, awards type studio movies taking those places and a lot of vanity projects from celebrities taking places in those. And now with streamers putting all of their wares in those festivals and also all of their pilots for shows into those festivals, it's sort of it's sort of really pushing down and creating fewer and fewer spots. So I've noticed a number of filmmakers uh, that have been, you know, made multiple films on the festival circuit, not being able to get any movies on the circuit now, or very get a very few festival dates. It's become very difficult. So um, fingers crossed, we get in. <laughs> um, but uh, not to be a Debbie Downer there, but it has become a much tougher circuit and the politics have changed a little bit as well. So when I watch official rejection, I think, yeah, some of this is still true. And some of this, um, I might have come out a different way or there might be new politics uh, to, to place in there. Some addendums to things like premier status that might be more useful. So I think at this point, it's more of a, it's more of a, a museum piece of what the film festival circuit was like uh, 14 years ago. <laughs> it's hard to believe it's been uh, oh it's been God. that long. Paul and I know each other uh, since uh, since uh, ten till noon. That film that's behind him uh, played at uh, Phoenix Film Festival in uh, two thousand six. Two thousand six. So, My God, yeah, dude, it's, it's crazy. It's um, crazy. Uh, it's yeah, yeah but it's, uh, official rejection so old that they're I think they're sending in VHS screeners to festivals in the yes. mail. Like I think it's that yes. old. It's shocking. <laughs> yeah. Not only do we not send things by the mail, but no, who's got a VHS? <laughs> it was like, what, is it? <laughs> what do I need a door stop? Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So, what's the plan if uh, whether it, whether it hits festivals or not? What's the what's the distribution plan for? Uh, uh, well, uh, I uh, well we'll see. Again, it's I sort of a, this is an uneventful answer. We're seeing wait and see what happens with the festival circuit because the festival circuit can 
change the way your film is perceived. And that changes how we pursue distribution. What I like to do is while we're playing the festival circuit, while we're generating, you know, Googleable things, reviews, articles, press, play dates, um, we sort of leverage that uh, attention for, uh, distrib- for distributors. And so if that doesn't happen, we have to come at distributors a different way. Um, but there are ways to do it. And, you know, now that I'm living in the UK, um, there are a lot of, uh, 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 here specifically, there's a rash of neighborhood independent theaters all over the city. Uh, all in all the different boroughs of the town and uh, that are half their screens are dedicated to larger films or lar- to, to current releases, half dedicated to older releases and independent films. And so it is possible potentially to mount some sort of release in London, you know, and use that to leverage. So there's all kinds of different, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. There's a couple, there's some plans forming, but um, a friend of mine, Lucas McNelly, he has a film called Upcountry. And uh, he, which this will this will blow your mind. He shot it in 2010. He just finished it, so <laughs> I'll show you how long it goes. He finished it last year. He submitted it to festivals. I don't think it got into really any that he wanted to get into. So he pulled it, and what he did was he just he's he's in Maine. He's a local Maine guy and there's no independent film infrastructure in Maine, at least that he's aware of. Because of that, when he four walls his film in a local theater in Maine, he can get into the, the big newspapers and not just in his hometown, he can get into them in, in the Maine papers and Bangor and all the other main, the main cities. And so he's done that and he sold out the screening and now he's, because of that, other theaters are contacting him and he's mounting a very strategized main um theatrical distribution for this this movie he's and from the one screening is already in the black on the film so wow. he's now mounting this and he's using that to now drive dvd sales and blu-ray sales and create promotion for vod and this is sort of you know how he's doing it so there's there are always more than one way to skin the cat and always a different way to come at it um but him watching him leverage that to me is very inspiring to come at it a different way and to use the uniqueness of his situation to drive the film because ultimately that's what separates you from the deluge of independent films is how are you separate what's your what's your what's your currency because whatever makes you unique is your currency you know and that's how there's a, a way to, to find out what that is and thread the needle on getting your film out there to the world that's a great way to look at it and also really uh, awesome advice for any independent filmmakers who, uh, who may be watching this. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and on that topic. And on that topic. What is one piece of advice that you would give to independent filmmakers or any filmmaker at any budget level who maybe isn't experienced with visual effects but thinks, you know, I really need VFX to tell this story? What's, what's one piece of advice you would, you would share with them as they embark on that? Oh, my God. Plan, plan, plan. And don't plan alone. Plan with your visual effects artist, right? It's plan with them. Don't dictate. Don't Just plan. Here's what I want to do. That's it. And come up with a game plan with as much time as you have, as much advanced time as you have, and as much and as as detailed and as thoroughly as you can plan. You know, plans will always come asunder. Things will always change. But the more you plan, the more completely you plan, the better you can change those plans when when things happen. And working with your visual effects artist ahead of time, working with them before you get into set. Um, one, they're going to, you're going to, they're going to be better prepared to, to give you what you need and you're going to be better prepared to give them what they need to give you what you need. But also, uh, you're investing them in the process. Things do go awry, but they feel that they're a valued contributor to this. They're going to, they're going to give you more, you know, people who are motivated, people like <laughs> visual effects are creative people. If you if you engage them creatively, you're going to get more out of them. That's simply what it is. Great answer. So what's next for you, Paul? What, do, what projects do you have in, in the pipeline? Uh, well, I am currently uh, developing a new 
film that will be shot in the UK with a combination of UK and US actors. And we're just sort of still figuring it out, but uh, leaning towards sort of quirky murder mystery. We'll see where that goes. But uh, it's still, honestly, it's, it's still in the germinal stages of figuring it out. Uh, it's sort of like um, elements keep presenting themselves. I'm like, oh, how do I incorporate that into the stew? You know, <laughs> it's sort of like trying to, trying to strike inspiration from the things around you and going, okay, well, how does that work in? Um, I have found um, something I've learned as a writer is that when I f find things that interest me at the moment or interest me at the time or things that are worrying their way into my life that are that I have a, an authentic reaction to and finding ways to weave those into the story, I get a much more authentic feeling tale out of it. That's what it seems to me. Like, you know, fluorescent pieces is an audit series of elements, but my, you know, my frustrations are in there. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that, that's sort of where I, I do my best work. So honestly, it's, it's figuring out, figuring out the stew right now. Gotcha. Well, I'm looking forward to whatever the whatever shape the stew takes, and uh, whatever uh, ingredients I can I can help contribute. Well, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Where can uh, people find out more about what Paul Osborne is up to? Uh, well, you can follow me on all the socials: uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and Instagram. I'm at Paul Makes Movies on all of those. Uh, that's it. Find me on the socials. You'll find me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for uh, taking the time, Paul. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, and uh, you are incredibly knowledgeable about independent film because you've been at this for so long. <laughs> and uh, I hope that uh, that's not an old joke. <laughs> I've also been at this for so long. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I hope that our audience got, uh, got a lot out of this. I think that uh, uh, all independent filmmakers out there could learn a lot from from Paul Osborne. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, for, thank for thank you for having me. And thank you for all the, all the love. And thank you for looking exactly like me and having my same name. I think <laughs> uh, all your guests should look like this and be named Paul. Yes. It's a special filter that we apply in post. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us on today's episode of the VFX for Indies podcast. You can find transcripts, images, and other cool stuff at our website, vfxforindies.com. If you enjoyed the show, please Subscribe, follow, like, rate, review, comment on either YouTube or your favorite podcast app. On behalf of everyone at Foxtrot X-Ray, I'm Chief Pixel Pusher, Paul Denegris, and we all thank you so much for your support of the show.